Good morning. Jen Dobre Borso. I'm not sure if that applause was just as a welcome or because I pronounced Jen Dobre kind of correctly. Um, what I love about being in Poland is that it's like one of the few places in the world where they'll pronounce my Dutch surname correctly, um, uh, but, but Dyson uh, is, a, is a different matter, so I like that. Because um, at work in England, it's always the other way around. Um, so yeah, my name is Ryan Den Royen. I work for, uh, for, for Dyson, um, with the caveat that I've only been there three months. I joined from, uh, uh, from, from Google, where I spent close to, uh, close to five years of my time. Um, but really exciting time to join the company because Dyson is going through a big uh, change when it comes to data uh, and analytics. Uh, part of this is driven by the fact that they have launched a whole new series of products that are connected. So, uh, you know, you might have seen the Dyson uh, robots or the purifiers, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and there's other stuff in the pipeline uh, as well. So obviously that means that from being a company that just specializes in uh, mechanical and, and, and electrical and uh, such engineering, they now also need to take data engineering on board, which is uh, really exciting, you know, to get to shape something like that. The second change is just that as the company has grown, uh, obviously that means more data in general, right? More data from production, more data from uh, the business, more data from sales, from customers. And like many companies, making sense of that data, uh, you know, is no longer just a nice to have, you know, it's now critical uh, to, to sustaining uh, that growth and, and, and running a business uh, running a business properly. So in this presentation, wow, literally just noticed this. Um, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's fine because you know, most of my slides don't really need, need the colors. As long as you can kind of read the words, that's okay. Uh, I'm glad it were black because at least this kind of works. Um, so in this presentation today, uh, I have to warn you beforehand, it's kind of the reverse warning that I usually give at conferences, which is there will not uh, be any sequel uh, or any code in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of for two reasons. The first is that because our team is, is now in the process of, of, of ramping up, there's a lot of things that are in progress, uh, but I can't yet stand here on stage and say, look at all this great work we did, you know, that'll have to come at next year's edition. The second is that when I was discussing, you know, with, with, with some colleagues, you know, what topic might be interesting for us as Dyson to address, you know, we kind of realize that a lot of companies, you know, come to these events and they show off, you know, their latest and greatest use case. You know, they say, oh, look, you know, we, we did some fantastic machine learning on, on GPUs, on rigs we built ourselves, and, and look, how, look how smart this is. Um, and while that's uh, really interesting, the reality is that most of what companies struggle with when it comes to big data isn't those high-performance edge cases. You know, a lot of it just relates to, uh, you know, the bigger questions around, you know, how you actually make big data useful for your organization, what it actually looks like to transform an organization, uh, you know, from a more traditional, um, you know, uh, kind of business intelligence mindset to a more kind of like real-time data-as-a-service mindset. And of course, this makes sense because yeah, I know, this is intense. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a, a Lumascape of the big data landscape that Firstmark, uh, puts to, Firstmark Capital puts together every year. And it's a fantastic overview because, you know, a few years ago, you know, there were like a quarter of as many little logos. Uh, yeah, they're logos, believe it or not. I know it's hard to tell. Um, and now, you know, it's just, it's incredible, right? I mean, even for someone like myself who's been, who's been kind of following these developments for the last decade, you know, it's just very difficult to keep track of everything that's going on, which means that when organizations say, you know, let's do big data, uh, it's not quite as easy as just saying, hey, you know, let's, you know, call up one company or, you know, implement one technology. Um, it's really about understanding a much larger ecosystem. Um, but there's another problem, and that is that, uh, when it comes to this hype curve, which I'm sure all of you will have seen before, uh, the Gardner hype curve, um, it's very difficult to tell where we actually are, right? So if we take social media, for example, I think, you know, we all remember the days when it just came out and people said, you know, traditional media is dead, you know, uh, traditional advertising is dead. It's all about, you know, consumers giving each other the news. I mean, look how that worked out, right, America? Um, uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, it's going to be a, a direct conversation between brands and, 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 and customers. Of course, the reality is that that didn't work out. There were a bunch of crises. Brands spent millions uh, on, on failed campaigns. And now we're somewhere here where people say, hey, actually, social media is just another marketing channel, right? If you use it properly, it actually yields benefits, right? And you can measure those benefits. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, it's not going to replace everything else. But of course, with big data, it's, it's a bit more challenging because what are we really talking about, right? Are we talking about 
you know, distributed file storage? Are we talking about MapReduce, right? December 2004, I believe, the original paper was published, right? I mean, that's probably all the way here. You know, or are we talking about some of the newer uh, stuff around, you know, uh, AI, different types of uh, ML, uh, you know, different types of um, different types of analyses uh, and forecasting, you know, which which might live somewhere here. And this is difficult because, you know, when you work in this field and you actually get hands-on with this stuff, you might be able to distinguish between those, and you can say, hey, some of this stuff is kind of just standard practice when it comes to doing big data, um, whereas other pieces, yeah, are far more out there. But of course, the people who often end up signing off, you know, the budget for these projects, you know, have a very different understanding, right? They just go, shit, I was at a conference, you know, some consultant told me we need to do big data, so let's do big data, right? Um, and what, what's fortunate is that Dyson, you know, is an engineering company, and engineers obviously like to figure things out. So I think, you know, we're in a, and again, one reason why I joined the company is because we're in a really good place where people have actually said, okay, we appreciate that we need to get smarter about the way that we leverage data, we need to build capabilities to be able to handle big data, uh, you know, whether it's volume, velocity, or, or, or variety. But at the end of the day, you know, it is, it is, uh, you know, it's important to kind of focus on focus on those details. So today, what I want to talk about is is what kind of ha can happen uh, and how to avoid something like this happening, where yeah, you can't really tell, but this is like in the wild west somewhere. It's like a ghost town, right? It looks pretty, but there's nobody there's nobody there, uh, because. You know, I, I I go to quite a few uh, events with my you know with my with my peers, and it's clear that a lot of companies find themselves struggling you know with this type of business transformation, right? They find themselves you know investing heavily uh, in in certain technology platforms, you know, in in hiring uh, developers, you know, such as yourselves. Um, you know, they get all all excited. You know, maybe they even you know publish a big press release, you know, saying that they've got some really uh, high profile uh, partnership. Um, but then the benefits just fail to materialize, right? There's there, the internet is full of cartoons about data lakes turning into data swamps. Um, you know, or data ghost towns, right, where it all looks like fantastic and great, but the reality is nobody really uses, uses them. Um, and as we're going through this transformation as, 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 as Dyson, you know, we obviously want to avoid this type of scenario, right? I mean, selfishly, because I don't want to get fired, um, but also just because, you know, when you, like I said, have an appreciation of technology, when you're really passionate about this stuff, you want to make sure that other people see that as well. You know, you want to make sure that other people can realize that benefit. And the nightmare scenario, realistically, is that somebody goes, look, that was great, but that's not for us. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, this stuff is for everybody. Every company should be embracing, you know, this, this, this type of mindset and these type of technologies at whatever, uh, whatever a level. So how do you prevent this scenario? Well, Anybody know what this, it is like a guessing game now with these colors. Anybody know what this poster is from? Magnificent Seven, yes, the original, not the, not the, not the remake, which was not great. Um, I had one person come up to me after an earlier presentation when I, sh when I showed uh, this, this and, and made a comment, and he was like, yeah, you know, presentation is fine, but I disagree with you, the remake is fantastic. So I'm sorry if I've offended anyone uh, with the last comment. But yeah, so seven principles to pre prevent, uh, you know, these kind of big data transformations, big data initiatives um, uh, from, from ending up like a ghost town. And I realize, by the way, that I'm being horrendously vague in my, in my use of, of big data here. Um, but really, to me, you know, it's kind of the full spectrum of technologies. So whether somebody is saying, hey, look, we just need to find a way of you know uh, ingesting you know near real time data from connected devices you know whether it's Kafka or NiFi or whatnot whether it's people saying look you know we want to have more granular uh, financial reporting and we want to have some type of machine learning in there to do anomaly detection and whatnot it doesn't really matter what the application is what matters is kind of the suite of technologies like I said that you would have been able to discern on that beautiful chart were it not a bright uh, green I believe it was um, so yeah the seven principles so the first is uh, I think technology, right? Obvious technology. Um, some technology choices matter, right? I mean, this is taken, I think, from a 2013 uh, paper um, where, yep, you know, when you have an MPP engine like, like Dremel, right, or Impala or whatever, it is faster than if you use a MapReduce-based system. No shit, right? These kind of technology choices matter, and they're really important. 
Um, and I think you know, this is why also a certain level of technical knowledge is important throughout the organization. Because at the end of the day, even if you're a CFO and you want to stay as far away from this technology as possible, it helps to have some understanding why you're choosing one system over the other. However, that's pretty much where I would draw the line. And that is not where the line is being drawn by the industry, right? I mean, if you go online and you type in, you know, like, which technology should I use? You know, you kind of use the business language to, to, to look for this stuff. Um, you know, you find just an insane amount of comparisons, right? An insane amount of companies, whether it's startups or established uh, uh, or larger established players, all, you know, broadcasting that their technology is the best. It's unique, right? It uses corner storage. Wow. You know? And that confusion frustrates the hell out of me because it makes our lives a lot more difficult, right? Because what happens when people f are faced with this confusion? One of two things, right? Like either they say, oh, well, this is not something I want to engage with until I know more, right? Whereas the reality is that the technology at the root of a lot of this is pretty simple, right? I mean, yes, you can implement in complex ways, but the base principles are pretty simple. Um, so there's no reason to get hung up on this stuff. Or this confusion just causes people to kind of go along with things, but never quite being bought in. And then at the first you know, or second sign of, of, of kind of like trouble or delay, people say, oh shit, I knew this was a mistake. I knew we shouldn't have gone with something you know, as like experimental as big data. I told one of the executives you know, recently, I said, guys, I said, you know, this technology we're talking about is older than your kids. You know, like this isn't some crazy new thing, you know, sure, yeah, if you want to deploy an AI-powered chatbot for your consumer goods brand, maybe that's something I'd hold off on on the enterprise scale. But most of this stuff is tried and tested. It's not rocket science. Also, guys, there's some seats at the front. Like, you're very welcome. I promise not to do, like, an awkward Q&A where I pick on you. So, yeah, they look very comfy. And these people look nice, you know? Don't blame me if they turn out not to be nice, but they look nice. Um, so, that's, so, that's, so that's one. So I think that's a really important one. The second one relates a bit to the technology piece, um, you know, and it's all to your own legacy, right? You never hear companies talk about legacy on stage, which is fascinating because as soon as the doors close, that's all that happens, right? So I was at a, a CDO um, a summit recently, and uh, you know, somebody, somebody presented some great uh, system about you know, like industrial uh, uh, IoT you know, and, and all this great Lambda architecture, and we're all sitting there nodding going, yeah, this is awesome, this is so cool. And then we go for coffee break. And a couple of us are standing around, and everybody's going, yeah, shit, that's never going to happen. And I turned to one of the guys and go, what do you mean this is never going to happen? He goes, well, Ryan, the fact is that just in my department alone, we have more than 1,500, 1,500 different systems. And I'm like, that's a lot. And he goes, yeah, and the worst part is, we don't really know what most of them do. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, shit, I'm like, can't you just like, turn them off one by one? He goes, no, 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 <laughs> because the fun bit is, we do know that they're all connected. <laughs> So in other words, if we know that we pull one out, we might just, like, and this was a financial institution, you know, we might just take out, like, one of our core banking systems. We just have no idea. Um, and this is, you know, and this is, this is crazy, right? This is, is a crazy system. And, and, and again, it makes sense why that happened, right? I mean, nowadays, you know, all the technologies or the vast, vast majority of the technologies we're leveraging are open source, right? There's a lot of ability to move data uh, in and out. But, of course, a lot of these old systems still come from a world where, you know, if you wanted a certain application, that came with a certain database, and there was no choice there, and it came with a certain piece of hardware, right, and had to be installed on premise, you know, and had to come with specific servicing and licensing agreements, etc. Um, and that just created a world of hurt. So, you know, a lot of people look at this big data stuff and they go, oh, shit, I don't want to go for that transformation. Like, I know, uh, blah, 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 Python, etc., just got a lot of machine learning, it sounds amazing, but this, we don't want to do it. So I've actually turned around and said, guys, if we do this stuff, this is the great liberator, right? All this pain and hurt you have, you know, we can start taking it away by, 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 by transferring things, you know, into an environment which is more collaborative, you know, which is, you know, fundamentally open source, which is better documented, you know. Um, and again, you know, it's something, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like dirty laundry, right? I mean, like I'm... Uh, this picture is like a stock photo because I don't think any company would want to have pictures of their legacy server set up, uh, you know, out on out in front of the the public, right? It's a bit it's a bit it's a bit embarrassing, um, but I do think it's an incredibly important topic to 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 address. Um, models, right? Uh, hands up if you would consider yourself a statistician. <laughs> yeah, hands up if you know statistics. 
I, I'm not going to pick on you, I promise. It's like, anybody know what it, like a GLM is? Anybody ride, like, do like a bit of Bayesian stats before? Anyone? Sure, the answer is yes, but I know. These stats b just puts a fear of God into people, right? Like, I know for a fact, like, most people that, like, at co-conference will have had some, some form of, of stats, but the idea is always like, shit, you know, I haven't used this in a while, etc. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a statistician called George Box, and, and he had a great quote, which is that all models are wrong, right? But some are useful. Um, and I think that's a fantastic quote, and he obviously meant it in a term of, 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 of things like, like GLMs, right? I mean, are you, if you're trying to measure, uh, you know, the effectiveness of your advertising, are you actually, you know, including the right type of variables to account for your TV spend, you know, and your digital spend and whatever? Um, but I think it also applies to data models, right? And that's something um, that's also incredibly important. So uh, this here is a cat, right? I think we can all just about discern that this is a cat, even though the cat is green. Um, that's a model of a cat. I didn't draw it, but I found it, and my drawings actually look very similar. Um, don't judge me. Um, what's wrong with my model of the cat? No eyes. No eyes. Thank you, Warsaw. No eyes. Um, but terrible model. Okay, fine. Um, now, this is really awkward, actually, because the screen is green. But imagine the screen was white, and the cat has green eyes. The next bit I would say is, okay, fine. So we draw some eyes on this, 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 this kitten, right? Um, and I say, here's your model, right? And then it goes off into, uh, uh, you know, goes off to production, right? Whether it's, you know, modeling, you know, a customer or a record or, uh, you know, uh, something or transaction record or whatever else. Um, and then we get feedback and it's like, yeah, the model's wrong. Like, what do you mean the model's wrong? Like, it's, like, it's clearly cats, got the ears and the whiskers, right? And it's got even like drew little eyes. It's like, yeah, however, what we really needed for our model to be effective, you know, to whether it was like training, training something with, uh, uh, you know, machine learning or just because we want to report along a certain dimension, what we really needed was the eye color. So the fact that I drew this model in black and white means the model is wrong. And, you know, th this is like a, obviously a little bit of a facetious example, but this happens time and time again in, in, in organizations, right, where people say, you know, we just need to have, you know, data on X. So somebody says, okay, you know, like, if we're describing a retail location, you know, we probably want to have, you know, the coordinates, right, GPS coordinates. We probably want to know, you know how many people work there. We want to know maybe how, what the footfall is, et cetera. But unless you get all the stakeholders around the table and say, yeah, okay, we understand, we all understand the basics. We all have some rough idea in our heads of what this model means. What does it mean specifically, right? What are all those, uh, you know, variables you need to include, right, whether it's, you know, like I said, applications end up being as simple as reporting or as complex as, as, as building some, uh, you know, clever, clever machine learning model. You know, having that agreement is incredibly important. And the reality is that those discussions are often quite dull, right? People don't want to have these type of discussions. They'd much rather just say, just give me the data and we'll figure it out later. But if you have those discussions in the beginning, it will save you so much time. And on that topic, data governance. Hands up if you like data governance. I thought the guy in the back was, was raising his arm, but he was adjusting his glasses. Uh, that was mean. Uh, in Wroclaw, I had one person. Um, yeah, so, yeah, people don't like data governance. Why? Data governance really is just about asking tough questions, right? It's asking tough questions. Cool, we've got data. Um, who owns it, right? Who controls access to it, right? Who made sure we have the permissions to use this data? Now that we have this data, you know, how are we storing it, right? How are we granting access, etc. you know, closely related to this modeling discussion. And these are incredibly important questions to ask for any organization. And, 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 and again, you know, you rarely see somebody, you know, at a conference talking about how their company is spending a huge amount of time doing this kind of stuff because they'd much rather show off something really fancy. But the reality is if you go to any, you know, big company, um, you know, the majority of the time they spend often, you know, is in discussions about stuff like this. You know, it's not about the latest and greatest implementation, you know, of, of, of TensorFlow, you know, or some really clever thing they built in D3. Because as much as they might want to do that kind of stuff, the fact is this is incredibly necessary and more necessary than ever because, of course, we've got um, uh, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, coming in uh, in Europe next May, uh, I believe. So, Again, incredibly, incredibly uh, 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 relevant um, to a lot of our roles because at the end of the day, it's like building a house. Any of you ever built a house? I have, I have not, but I mean, I built a house in Minecraft. Um, now, Minecraft, you have regulations. 
Uh, so I, I didn't have to worry about, about, about the government or surveyors coming in, etc. But of course, if you buy a, or build a house in the real world, you know, you just kind of just go ahead and you build something, then at a certain point, you know, maybe the council will show up and say, look, your house is too damn ugly for our village, you know, and they knock it down or they fine you, you know, a bazillion dollars. Um, and, and data governance really is, is, is similar, where if at the beginning you actually sit down, you know, with an architect who knows their shit, um, and you sit down with the relevant authorities, right, which you know, might be someone in your legal team or whoever, um, and say, hey, look, this is what we're trying to build. Are we building it the right way? It will save you a world of hurt. And again, it's so freaking obvious, but the amount of companies that totally ignore this stuff and then only afterwards say, oh, yeah, shit, we got audited and now we're totally screwed is, is, is yeah, is, is, is mind-boggling. And again, an advantage of working at an engineering company like Dyson is that engineers are detail-oriented. So I think everybody gets this, which is, which is nice. Training. Um, anybody here read XKCD? Anybody here not read XKCD? Wow, like <laughs> most of you guys are like, anybody's arms working? Yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, XKCD essential. That's funny. I gave a talk at a college um, on on Monday, uh, and I and, and they they all wanted jobs and like technology and, and whatnot. So and I said, anybody here read XKCD? And like a few people raised their hands. And I said, look, I said if you don't, you know, it'll probably double your bro bro job prospects if you actually do because this will probably come up at some point in a discussion where you're meeting the team. Um, so with, you know, with, 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 with training, I mean, this is an example from, from ML. Like, yeah, people ha usually have no idea what technologies uh, mean when it comes to large organizations. Um, and it's either because of one of two reasons, right? One is just that people, you know, they, they, it's not really related to their core expertise, right? You might have somebody in marketing who's heard about, you know, the wonders of AI and suddenly they go around the business saying, hey, look, we need to put some AI in that. And you're like, what, what do you mean? It's like it's a flyer. Yeah, but it needs more AI. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's do it, right? Or machine learning. Oh, my God. Every meeting I have, pretty much, uh, somebody will say to me, yeah, Ryan, what we need to do is some machine learning. And I say, okay, <laughs> what, are you, what is a machine going to learn, right? What training data do you have? And people look at me like training data. Then we just like deploy the machine for the learning. And I said, we can do it. I said, but getting a machine learning model uh, is a bit like getting a puppy. Right? Anyone can go out and deploy a model just like anybody can go out and deploy a puppy. Not just a technical term, deploying a puppy. Um, but you can deploy a puppy. Uh, the problem is that without the training data, that puppy will shit on your couch and chew up your girlfriend's rug, right? Uh, uh, or, or boyfriend's rug, if your boyfriend really likes rugs. Um, so yeah, it is a, it is a, uh, it is, it is, it is not, uh, it is not, uh, it is not ideal. Um, and the second problem is, is that yeah, even if people have got a certain background in something, right? I mean, I did quite a sciency, sciency degree. Um, the reality is the world changes so quickly, right? I mean, like I follow all, you know, all the relevant news in this space, and I look at that. Lumascape in the beginning, I was like, holy shit, like I have no idea what half these things are, like where they even came from, right? So the ability to kind of stay up to date is critical, right, in our, in our, in our, in our, in our industry, particularly because it's so relevant. Yet many companies assume that as long as you've hired a developer, it's fine, right? You know, you just let people do whatever. So I'm telling people, like, guys, we need to, like, do training. And people are like, yeah, but, like, they're developers. Can't they just, like, develop? And it's like, yeah, it's... Not that, not that straightforward, especially not in this kind of landscape. Um, so one of the other things we're doing as well is is actually kind of trying to train the business. So one of the one of the data analysts on our team, um, uh, you know, Pavel, he he put together a presentation, um, and he's putting together actually a presentation series. You know, like ha just half an hour talks around kind of like big data and applications of this stuff, so that people in the organization can actually just yeah, if they're interested, like actually learn what this stuff is about, right? Kind of demystifying it and reducing uh, reducing that level of uh, reducing that level of, of of type of fear, I guess. Um, culture. So this picture, wow. I mean, this is just wow. I <laughs> I know what this picture is, and even I'm having trouble discerning. Oh, there it is. There's the guy. Cool. So this is a picture of a uh, of a Toyota uh, of a Toyota car plant. I believe this is in Osaka. Um, does anybody know why Toyota became famous as a car brand? Exactly, Toyota production system, yep, Agile, etc. Yeah, so they were basically the first ones to say, hang on a second, if we're producing cars and one in every so many cars comes off the line and it's just broken and we need to go out and take that whole car apart and figure out what's broken and then keep doing that, that is a waste of everybody's time and money, right? And the American car manufacturers had been just dealing with that problem for ages by just effectively throwing more money at it 
Um, but the Japanese were like, that's just wasteful. So let's be smart about this. So they yeah, came up with a system where as soon as something you know, went, 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 went wrong or they noticed a defect, it would effectively halt everything and say, let's figure out what the problem is. And they came up with a really simple way of identifying what that problem was. Right? Um, they basically asked why. Super obvious. Um, but what they did is they, they always said, you, know, you have to ask why five times. Because that way, you, know, you actually get to the root cause as opposed to the proximate cause. Right? So, uh, you know, with a car, for example, like, hey, you know, the horn, you know, the horn isn't working. Oh, why is the horn not working? Oh, because the cable's not connected. Fine, right? That's an answer, right? And that's that's usually the kind of answer you're giving your job. But so you also then, you know, five whys, right? So the cable's not connected. Okay, why is the cable not connected? Oh, because whatever the crimping thing was on the production line um, didn't crimp it. Why did it not crimp it? Oh well, huh? Because the machine, you know, wasn't wasn't activated. Why was the machine not activated? Oh, that's weird because like it wasn't plugged in. Hang on a second, but it was plugged in this morning. Why was it not plugged in now? Oh, because somebody probably tripped and unplugged the cable. Okay, so why they trip? Well, because they didn't see the cable. Okay, fine. Now let's paint the cable high-vis orange or yellow or whatever, or just put like one of those little steppy things over it so that the cable won't get unplugged again. The end. All of a sudden, right, you solve problems uh, in a much better way. And it's like insanely obvious, right? And I feel a little bit stupid standing on stage, you know, telling telling people like yourself this, but... I see so few companies who actually take this approach to kind of data analysis, right? The amount of times, you know, I've seen people looking at sim something as simple as a revenue chart and like the revenue dips. I'm like, why is the revenue down? Oh, you know, because we had less sales. Cool. But why do we have less sales? Oh, well, you know, just because, you know, we, did, we sold less of this one model. Why do we sell less of this one model? Right? Is it that we didn't have the inventory for it? Was it just the fact that people are buying a different model instead? Like, what's happening? Um, and I think, you know, like, with a lot of this kind of data stuff, again, this comes, I guess, to the kind of the, the, the question around, um, you know, kind of training and awareness as well, which is why this falls under culture. You know, people, if people feel distant from the technology, if people feel distant from the data, they don't feel like they need to have that ownership, right? So they just go, okay, fine, it's whatever. You know, it's almost more like they want the data there so they can say they had data as opposed to them actually leveraging it. Um, so, so trying to figure out how to get the business close to the stuff and, and get, to get people close to the business, I think is, you know, is, is, really, uh, is, is, really, is really critical. Because if you can build that culture where you know, everybody feels that kind of ownership, right, and just feels that curiosity, right? Um, you, you know, you can, you can short circuit like so much, um, you know, so much kind of confusion uh, and so much uh, almost waste right in the process with people waiting on emails, et cetera, or ignoring emails, et cetera. Um, you know, like, you know, like, like, like Toyota found, right? If you hit the stop button the moment you spot a mistake and you figure out what it is, you will save a lot of time compared to waiting until all the cars are sitting there ready and a bunch of them are, are broken. Um, yeah, I'll say, you know, culture is a, is, you know, culture is a, is a, is a tricky one. It's because uh, you need to, it's a combination of, I guess, hiring for it as well as making sure that internally everybody's aligned. Um, so it's not an easy one, but it's definitely, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, and I guess the final one of the, of the, of the seven um, that, I, that I put to you is, is storytelling, analytical storytelling. Um, I have no idea what the original colors were on this one, but fine, pink it is. Uh, it's kind of Dyson colors, the purple and the pink. Um, so yeah, storytelling is, is really important. Um, any of you ever do storytelling training? One guy, nice. Any of you have kids? If you've got kids, you've done storytelling training. Um, most powerful wor words in the English language, I can't speak for Polish, but it's like once upon a time, right? Once upon a time, what? Tell me, Ryan, I must know. Did I get married happily ever after, kill the dragon? Um, and yet, you know, we all, we all know this, right? We all know it's true, it's all very intuitive, blah, 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 you know, whether we're playing video games or watching a movie or reading a book, right? It's, it's all about those stories, and yet, 99% of the information we consume, or at least I find myself consuming, you know, in any kind of business-related environment has nothing to do with stories, right? It's always like insanely dry, endless decks you're plowing through uh, and, and whatnot, uh, a bit maybe like this one. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's, it's a shame because the reality is that, you know, our, our, our brains are wired in a certain way. Um, and again, it ties to, to the cultural piece where, this has to this has to kind of this has to kind of I guess almost be an accepted idea where you know when you go into a presentation you know if somebody said hey help me understand how to you know 
optimize my manufacturing, you know, you go in and say, look, you know, I'm going to tell you a story about how we came from here to here, and da, da, da. and it has to be an accepted, accepted, um, I guess, kind of uh, approach because people need to be willing to listen. But the reality is that if it works, it pays off so well because our brains are wired for this kind of stuff. You know, and again, to the you know, two to five, two to five, two to five whys, if you have a clear understanding of, you know, what's going on and what's been driving it, it's very easy you know, to spin it into a story, right? It's hard to do if you don't understand that why. So back to the sales example, you know, if I say, oh, you know, there once was a day where sales dropped, so we made less money. The end. That's a pretty shit story, <laughs> right? That's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty shit story. Um, it's, it's better than the original Dutch. But no, it's a pretty, pretty shit story. Um, but if I say, you know, like, okay, you know, like, you know, picture shop floor, you know, uh, you know, gleaming machines, you know, and, and, and stuff rushing in, you know, and Takashi, you know, trips, you know, and picks himself up, you know, goes to the station, etc. Yada, 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 blah, 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 you know, over time, you know, everybody thinks it's working, but, you know, actually something's going horribly wrong, and we didn't realize, but there are people like, shit, you know, this is like an epic, and there's all these things going wrong, and how didn't we realize? Um, now I realize, obviously, there's only there's a, there's a limit to how exciting you can make a a industrial production related uh, story, um, but it it just it just helps convey information in a much more much more memorable uh, memorable way. And and the funny thing is that you know I think in organizations you know people kind of realize this, but they often say, well, you know that's marketing's job or that's PR's job, right? But with all due respect to marketing and PR, most of them have no clue about the data. Right? Like, unless you're a developer, unless you're an analyst, right? You don't have that appreciation of statistician. You don't have that appreciation, you know, of what's actually happening, you know, and, and you don't have that context, right? So uh, I, don't like, I don't like the idea of kind of splitting those things, things, things apart. And I think, you know, having, uh, having people have ownership over that story all the way from kind of figuring out what's actually going on to being able to uh, relay it to whoever the individual audience is. I find helps, uh, helps a lot. So before I dive into this bit, um, those four roughly make sense. Sorry, four, those seven roughly make sense. Anything I said is com which complete nonsense. It's funny, I, I, when, when I presented this in Wroclaw, I said, look, I'm presenting this again in Warsaw, so you know, please tell me now if something's absolutely terrible because uh, that way I can, I can edit the slides. Nobody told me to take anything out, so if I've shown you something which is complete bollocks, blame it on the guys in Froslav. They clearly wanted me to fail. Um, let me talk to you just for some really practical examples about what we're working on at, at Dice and I guess who these, how these different factors, factors come, into, come into play. So finance, I mean, is like the most straightforward one, right? I mean, there's a reason a lot of the BI teams, analytics teams, you know, in organizations traditionally fall under finance because there's the idea that you know, finance has the data and what's our most important data? It's finance data. I don't agree with that at all, but whatever, fine. Um, so from a technology perspective, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, like you can pretty much use most systems that are in place. You don't need to change uh, a lot of the ways you do, you do reporting, et cetera. Um, I guess the two, two big, big uh, changes kind of come in uh, when you're talking about kind of like, yeah, the legacy and the modeling side, which is mainly around granularity, right? One of the appeals of having this kind of big data and analytics ability is the ability to get very, very granular and, 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 and slice data any way you want to. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, these old systems where it's, it's pre-aggregated to a certain level by, by, by default, you're unable to do so. And this, of course, is tricky because when you don't have that level of detail, when you don't have all those different variables that you can break out, you, know, you can't, for example, yeah, do, 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 do modeling, right? You can't do forecasting well, but you also can't do things like automated anomaly detection well because you, know, you can't monitor those individual, um, individual parameters. Uh, on the bright side, though, if you get that stuff sorted out, the rest, you know, governance, culture, training, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, you know, until you get to the storytelling, uh, the storytelling piece. Because again, you know, like a lot of people just, you know, like saying, hey, look, with finance, these are the numbers. And why? Well, because we had a good year or we had a bad month. Um, and again, you know, when you say we have this, when you have all of this, when you all have all of this data, and especially when you have this data, which ties to different parts of the company, when you can actually start to include, uh, you know, data from production, when you can start to include data from like CRM, you know, online behavior as well as offline behavior, uh, etc., you can tell a much richer story, and you can help people understand uh, the actual context, um, uh, you know, as opposed to 
yeah, just effectively reporting on, on what you've seen, which isn't half as, isn't half as actionable. Um, marketing. Um, why a coin? Oh, ah, yes. Yanis, two-faced god, god of journeys, customer journeys. Um, also because face of the customer, right? So an example in our world, Dyson, online, offline, right? We have retail stores. Um, I'm not sure if we have them in Poland. If you see one, check it out. They're pretty great. Um, and, you know, those retail stores, you know, obviously fantastic uh, outlets, right? It's a very rich experience for, 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 for consumers. We have ways of capturing data uh, from people in those retail uh, environments. However, if somebody, you know, comes into a retail environment and then goes online and buys whatever product they were looking at, how do we know that it's the same person, right? Um, and that's, you know, not, a, not just a challenge that Dyson faces, it's a challenge that pretty much every uh, major brand uh, faces. And this goes beyond just the retail experience, right? I mean, like something um, critical as well, you know, it's like support, right? If somebody's bought five Dyson products, you know, and they call the customer support line, you know, and they give their name, you know, they probably don't want you know, the, com you know the, the support person to go, okay, cool, so, hi, yeah, who are you and why are you calling? Instead, you'd rather be like, oh, hi, Mr. Sanders. You know, of course, you know, like, which of your five appliances is malfunctioning today? You know, how can we help? How can we make it better? You know, have a free one because you're such a great customer. Um, and that is just not the experience for most of the, most of the, most of the world. Um, so, you know, from a technology point of view, the reality is that a lot of this stuff was unsolvable in the past, right? Talk, coming back to those legacy systems and those different servers and applications and whatnot. Um, that's very much the world we, we lived in, right? There was like software and a system for like newsletters. There was a software, a software and system for like call centers. There was one for retail location, web analytics. I mean, back in the day, I mean, God, I mean, yeah, Urchin maybe. Um, now, obviously, a much uh, more integrated uh, ability to analyze this, right? Whether you're talking about manually uh, 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 kind of like aggregating uh, uh, this data and joining it up, or you know, whether you opt for like uh, a player like Adobe who's able to offer a more integrated, uh, uh, a more integrated set of solutions. It doesn't really matter. The point is that you're now suddenly capable of doing it. Um, so the technology actually is, is the easy part with a lot of this, I mean, relatively speaking. The tough bit, um, other than getting the technology to talk to the legacy stuff, is around the modeling. Right, so if you ask a call center manager um, or operations director, you know, what is a customer to you? So, you know, probably first name, barely discernible <laughs> down the phone line, um, phone number, right? Probably a call duration or repeated call durations, right? Nice little nested record. Um, and maybe like a topic, right? Did we resolve their problem, yes or no? But if I ask somebody in logistics, they're going to give me a very different answer, right? The customer is an address. It has to be a validated address, you know, in a lot of cases, not like a P.O. box, um, you know, probably first name, last name, you know, if it's, it's got to be signed for, then et cetera, some other identifier. That are overlaps, right? Because there's a fair chance that you'll want that uh, phone number for that logistics piece as well. However, it might be a different phone number, right? Because a lot of people still end up calling call centers off their landline and then they when, they, when they're expecting a parcel, give their mobile phone number because they might be out. So, difficult, difficult, difficult. You know, people um, you know, often say, oh, you know, just create a single view of the customer. That's the way to start. And yeah, it's true, it is the way to start, but there are companies who have spent hundreds of millions of dollars um, just trying to get that single customer view built. And it's, this is why it's so hard. And again, coming back to kind of the culture and the training and everything, you know, it's important that you get that buy-in from the organization for this stuff because if you end up in a situation where you know you just ask people in the business hey what do you want they say oh just give me a customer view you know that's relevant for my world you're none the wiser right you need people to be really really specific um and you know with the work that we're doing on this you know we have you know working groups that have people from pretty much every facet of the company you know and they're very they're very kind of collaborative discussions where you know, it's not, oh, the people who work on the data stuff versus the rest. It's like we're all sitting on a table. We're like doodling on a whiteboard or little index cards going, okay, cool. Customer interactions. What is a customer interaction to us? Okay, it could be a phone call, call center. It could be going to the website. It could be them going into store, et cetera. Okay, what kind of granularity do we need? You know, is it enough that we have a customer record that says a customer called four times? Or do we need to have some greater level of detail, you know, where we, for each phone call, have a discrete record with topic or whatever, right? There's all kinds of ways of doing it. And the cool thing is that with, of course, our kind of big data tech world, you know, the sky's the limit, right? You can take that data, ram it into, like, Google machine, machine um, uh, uh, transcription, 
and translation, depending on where call centers are based, you know, and, and get full logs of every conversation, right? Might be useful if you're trying to do some automated anomaly detection um, or topic identification, but yeah, not necessary in a lot of the, a lot of the cases. Finally, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, the training and storytelling piece, once that other stuff is built and is well governed, um, oh, that's one thing to say. Governance, of course, important mainly because like with things like the, uh, you know, privacy legislation, you know, you need to make sure that you're handling customers' data in the, in, the right, in the right way and particularly that you're messaging this to customers, right? Customers don't mind giving you their personal information as long as they have a clear idea of, okay, I'm giving this to you because you're using it for this purpose. Again, super obvious. I'm a customer. I care about this stuff. Uh, but the amount of companies that just treat this as an afterthought is, yeah, is, is, is interesting. Um, yeah, like I said, yeah, training, storytelling, pretty straightforward, actually, when it comes to this, because a customer journey is by its very nature a story, right? I mean, like, even when, 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 media, when media and advertising folks do targeting, you know, they don't just target, you know, like, females, this bracket to this bracket, they target, like, types, right? This is Brenda, you know, Brenda really loves these TV shows, you know, Brenda has 2.4 kids, you know, and a cat. Um, so, yeah, you know, like, if you get all this other stuff right, then the end is usually very, very rewarding. Manufacturing. I love manufacturing. Hands up if you've worked with manufacturing data before. This is great, guys. Come join Dyson. Like, y you'll have a great time. So manufacturing data is really cool because it's physical, right? It's like actual stuff. And I don't know about you. Like I said, I, I love Lego as a kid. You know, the idea of building things makes me really excited. It's one reason why, um, yeah, I moved, I moved to Dyson. But for a very long time, you know, it was kind of a separate world from the rest of the business, right? Because there was the manufacturing stuff that happened, and sure, people logged things into a couple of systems, but it was quite separate. Now, all of a sudden, you know, we have all of this data from our actual device, right? Kind of industrial IoT, you know, you can track production in pretty much real time, right? And some of that, you know, is useful for the machinery itself, right? Detecting things like, you know, like, like, like faults, et cetera, and being able to have machines effectively self-diagnose, right? I think like every was G jet engine collects something like a terabyte of data, you know, per flight, right? It's very useful for that kind of predictive maintenance. Um, but it's also fantastic because it allows you to then suddenly tie this into the rest of the supply chain, right? So you can say, okay, we know that footfall is up in this shopping center, you know, in Warsaw. It's gotten more and more people have come to the store. Okay, you know, what does that mean? What type of products are they selling? Those products, how many do we have in the warehouse? In the okay, fine, how many do we have on ships? Okay, the ones that are from ships, how many do we have at our base in, let's say, Singapore? You know, and how many of those are we slated to produce? How much are we producing right now? Are we producing the exact target we set, or are we under or over in some way? You know, do we need to change anything on this end to actually make sure that we have stock levels here, right? I mean, really, really, really interesting, really interesting stuff. And from a technology point of view, yeah, a lot of this stuff is, 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 is pretty new, so you don't have to deal so much you know, with the legacy. You know, I mean, I think the, the tricky thing comes in with the culture and the training where I think for a very long time, you know, a lot of that production piece, like when it comes to quality, happened you know, with a clipboard, right? People would walk around going, huh, this thing doesn't look great. You know, we, need to, we need to do something, repair it or investigate something. So figuring out how you can ki kind of empower those people you know, with technology you know, and, and, and not make them feel like they're being replaced or they're, uh, all the work that they put into developing procedures um, you know, no longer matters, I think, is important. But from a technology point of view, it's pretty straightforward. For the modeling, uh, yeah, I mean, figuring out how that production piece fits, into with, it fits in with the rest of the, uh, you know, rest of the business. Um, you know, not... not you know, not insanely hard because again, you know, there's a nice little story, right? It's a nice connected, it's a nice connected world. Finally, on top of connected devices, yeah, uh, connected devices are great, right? A um, lot of lot of interesting, a um, lot of interesting uh, data for two reasons, right? One is that it allows you to create better products, right? It allows you to diagnose uh, products if they if they if they start to. Uh, you know, functions suboptimally, which is, you know, which is fantastic. Um, but it also just allows you to take data and combine data in ways uh, that create a much richer customer experience. So, you know, you can imagine, for example, with, with, the, with the purifier, this is the Dyson purifier, you know, that you can combine air quality data from the home, you know, with environmental air quality data, right? And you can use data from like local, uh, from local monitoring to enrich um, the picture you've got, and then you can either use it to make the machine smarter, right, to become better uh, at, at filtering out, uh, uh, filtering out, you know, pollutants and whatnot, or you can use it to, you know, to inform people 
and say, hey, you know, you've told us that you've got hay fever, for example. Well, actually, we've noticed that there's a, sp there's a wave of pollen or whatever, you know, coming. Um, so, you know, best turn this thing on, um, and that way you can avoid, you know, having those, uh, having those, kind, of, uh, those kind of reactions. Um, and I saw one of the other talk, uh, talks today is, like, the internet of, like, more useful things or like less awful things or something uh, and i thought it was quite a quite a good quite a good title because yeah the reality is with iot and like smart home most people don't really have an idea yet of what that means right i mean i have a google home literally all i ask it to do is to set timers when i'm cooking badly uh and 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 play spotify playlists um now that's not groundbreaking uh yet uh, but I'm part of the future, guys. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the data is great because part of you know this this because especially at the rate rate of change, you know, this data allows us to, like I said, make 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 better uh, make make better products, and you know, we're learning we're learning a lot from it. So it's cool. Technology point of view, uh, yeah, you know, you can't with all the other stuff, you can kind of do smaller data approaches, right? And you can kind of apply some of the smarter analytics to it. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're spitting out you know terabytes. Of, of connected connected data, you need a way of storing it sensibly. You need a way of processing uh, it sensibly. Uh, for legacy, <laughs> what legacy? Right, great um, models. This is a bit where it gets interesting. Where you kind of have two options, right, when it comes to these kind of products. You can either have somebody in, uh, for example, research build a build a product, you know, and then afterwards say, actually, we've got data coming out of this thing. What do we do with this data now? Or you can actually sit down and from the beginning have that partnership. Right, um, so it's no wonder our team, you know, spends a lot of time talking to, uh, you know, people in in research um, uh, and in the various the various parts of the company, precisely for that reason, so that we know, okay, you know, there's you know certain types of products coming, there's certain types of data coming. How do we make sure we're ready? You know, whether it's in terms of you know figuring thinking this through when we're creating models of our products or of our data or whatever, um, or whether it just comes down to you know, making sure that we have the right skill sets in place. Right? If you if you're working a lot with you know with real time data, you know there's certain skill sets and technologies that it's good to be to be aware of. Governance um, relatively straightforward, right? Because the data is relatively straightforward. I mean, if you've designed your designed your product well, it's just the standard questions of you know how do you retain data, right? How do you con how do you communicate to your consumers what you're doing with this data, um, etc. Not 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 rocket science, but again, just important uh, that you do and that you also set expectations. Uh, you know what that. Uh, you know what that kind of like the journey, uh, what that journey looks like. As for storytelling, fantastic, right? Like their connected device have such an ability to be, to be an integral part of somebody's life. You know whether it's, you know, a telematics in a car or it's a purifier. You know or it's you know hell connected connected light bulbs. Um, you know not to, not to mention uh, you know not to mention the kind of fitness related. I'm not sure about my watch. Like this isn't the Fitbit, but like the Fitbit, uh, uh, you know, the Fitbit and, and and type of connected devices. You know, they allow us to start start understanding just humanity in general. You know, better. You know, how do we live? How do we operate? And 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 more importantly, you know, how do we, um, yeah, how do we optimize that? Which is you know exciting. Like it's genuinely like it's genuinely cool, um, and therefore a nice nice story to tell. So yeah, so I went through these three points in this order: the kind of system stuff, right? Tech, legacy, process, governance, etc. People, you know, on kind of culture and training, storytelling. Um, you might have noticed I kind of did them in reverse order of importance. Now, what's funny is that actually uh, quite often we start with the, all the technology stuff, right? That's you know what conferences, what people talk about. But it is, it is, as far as I'm concerned, the least important bit. Now, some of you might violently disagree with me. If that's the case, then Royan, that's my Twitter handle. Please tweet me insults. Um, uh, I'll run them through. Google Translate later if you're creative with Polish, um, and yeah, you know when it comes to these kind of when it comes to these kind of things, you know that's a waste to me, right? Because quite often when companies talk about you know IT transformations, it's all about you know technology. What system do we buy? You know what vendor do we partner with, etc. And I'm sitting there going, what the hell? That is completely irrelevant, right? Like I said, like yeah, some technology decisions make sense, right? Are you running complex transformations on your data, right? You need some kind of MapReduce setup, fine. Or are we really just talking about some like really fast data warehousing where you can write some analytic queries? Great, go for something MVP. You know, and there's and there's other decisions you might need to make, right? Around data sizes, you know, ingestion frequency, right? NiFi, whatnot. Um, but again, you know, those things don't really matter so much. You know, processes are more important. Right? What data are you collecting? How are you how are you storing it? You know, um, you know, how are you modeling this data? Right? 
you know what what you know what kind of cat do you need right will my will my dodgy drawing without the eyes do or do you need something that's far more realistic right there are no wrong answers as long as there are well defined answers and again like just for kicks like ask people about their data models you know if you have nothing better to do because a lot of companies like really don't have an idea um, because it's just it's just fallen by the wayside at some point, which is just such a missed, such a missed opportunity, particularly in this world where we have this kind of clarity. And finally, people, right? All this stuff's important, but if you don't have the right kind of people in place, if you don't have the right kind of culture in place, if people aren't going to care about investing in, in, in people, investing in building the right kind of team capabilities, training people, you know, if, if storytelling doesn't matter, you know, if nobody cares about why they're seeing what they're seeing, then what the hell is the point, right? What the hell is the point? Um, you know, yes, I understand that on a checklist, you know, of being a, being a CIO, you know, you want to build, say, fine, we're doing big data and we're doing AI and we're doing ML. But that's a complete waste of everybody's time, right? A complete waste of everybody's time. So, personally, I think, you know, that's, this is pretty much, this is pretty much the order. But like I said, like, I encourage discussion afterwards. Um, and yeah, the truth of corporate big data. So, this is an iceberg, um, as you might be able to tell. And here's a whole bunch of stuff underwater and there's some gleaming stuff sticking out the top. Stuff called ice, I believe. Um, and this is, like I said I, at the beginning, you know, what I kind of feel a lot of, lot of uh, kind of discussion around kind of uh, corporate big data is about. You know, you always talk about the, the shiny stuff and you know how you know you're deploying the latest and greatest Apache project. How you've got some you know black ops team, you know, of three dis data scientists, you know, who've got TensorFlow running on like an Arduino, you know, and is now glued to like all your corporate vehicles. Like fantastic, right? That stuff matters and it's cool. Right? I mean, like, from this intellectual level, I like hearing about the stuff and, like, playing around that kind of stuff. But if you actually look at the stuff that drives billions of dollars, you know, for companies, it's not that, right? Definitely not that at that stage. You know, it's all the stuff that's beneath, this, beneath the surface, where people say, hang on a second, that dodgy Fortran mainframe from, like, the 70s, let's figure out how we can get transactions actually running via, you know, a cloud platform instead. You know, hey, this, the fact that we currently have 200 different places where customer data lives. How do we make sure we unite that in one way, which not only allows us to figure out how many customers we actually have, you know, and how, how many times we've duplicated them in the past, but also, you know, make sure that when a customer asks us, for example, to delete their information, we can get rid of it like that, you know, which is not just about, like I said, complying with, 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 the, with the laws and regulations. It's also just the right thing to do. Right? At the end of the day, like, we're all, you know, we're all, we're all customers as well. And like I said, you know, that's not always the most sexy stuff. Um, but that's okay, you know, because it's still, it's still, still important. Um, so yeah, where are we now? Um, yeah, I mean, like a lot of the stuff that I talked about today applies, applies to us. Like I said, I think we're blessed with a really great culture b because it's an engineering company, which, which helps a lot. But yeah, I mean, we're building a data as a service model, right? We're taking all these different systems and we're saying, look, instead of having all these different systems and having all these different, you know, access controls and basically just confusing everybody, let's just simplify it, right? Let's give people one data warehouse, you know, globally consistent and secure. Uh, that everybody can access, you know, and so that you can use, you know, data, f you know, whether you're in marketing or you're in research or in operations, you're in finance, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? You can use data um, to make better, better decisions and then combine it with training um, and all that other good stuff to also drive that cultural change. And finally, yeah, we're hiring, right? So we've got developers we're hiring for, um, uh, data analysts, data scientists, statisticians. Um, so if you're interested about this stuff, like, please do shoot me a line um, because it really is super it really is super fun, and I can't, I can't, uh, I can't stress that enough. Um, so yeah, in summary, data. Oh yeah, by the way, that's Matt Cartwright. He's our recruiter guy. So if you feel really enthusiastic, you can totally email him. He's awesome. Um, he's really cool. Um, but yeah, big data in practice is messy, right? Like it's, it's people don't like talking about this stuff because they don't like admitting that actually their companies are shambles. Um, I think I'm standing here because our company's in better shape than most, <laughs> but but the reality is like it's it's like the industry still is yeah it's still pretty um, it's still pretty yeah pretty messy just because you know because of a number of reasons, um, and yeah how do you solve that just focus on the simple stuff right people process systems you know in that order you know don't start with the technology you know no matter how convincing the sales pitch uh, at a conference might be, and the cool thing is there's a huge amount of potential to get this right. You know, I mean, I was at a, a conference recently, and somebody was telling me how um, how two years ago the the biggest discussion topic uh, that people had requested for the, for that conference um, was around technology, right? Like, what is the newest technology? What's newest data viz? 
Um, but this year it had changed. This year the biggest requested topic uh, had been around uh, kind of like team building and culture. Because they said all these people are, you know, all these employees are basically quitting. You know, and these are companies across the spectrum because people just feel like, you know, the work they came there to do isn't working out. You know, and in turn, some companies are feeling, like I said, like they got burnt. Um, and that's just a shame because this stuff really is cool. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's up to us, you know, to, I guess, make that dream real. Thank you.